If you know your function is continuous on an interval, you can't skip any of the y values between them. Right? Now, the first picture that I have there is just a simplistic linear function from point A to point B. Uh, there, you know, if, if it's asking uh, something about K, the y value between the y values and the points, there's got to be some x value that has that y value on that interval. There's at least one, okay, at least one number. That's an important little detail in there. So that's why I drew what looks like a cubic function. It could be a quartic uh, function. The time of the may start to curve back down. I don't know. It doesn't matter. Um, but I just wanted to draw another example of where this k value is y value somewhere between the y values and endpoints. It could be achieved three times on the end. It just kind of depends on your function. But you are guaranteed that it equals that value at least once once or more on the interval, if you have a continuous function. Very, very important that it must be a continuous function on that interval. So in simple terms, it means that a continuous function cannot skip values and you can't see in other words, a continuous function cannot skip values on that interval. And I think I've done the real Okay, I'm going to talk about that in a second. So, how is this used? Most of the time, this is used to prove that there is a zero on an interval. Okay, meaning that your function equals zero somewhere on an interval. Uh, so I've got another illustration here that illustrates that. If the question is, does this function equal zero anywhere on this interval? Well, this one would. as long as it's continuous, as long as it's continuous. I will keep repeating that over and over again because that's how they would get you on with these questions. They would give you a function that's not continuous. You start applying the intermediate value theorem, but technically you can't because it's not a continuous function. As I kind of mentioned with that last, uh, that last uh, example, visualization there, most often than not, they use the intermediate value theorem to prove or show that a function has zeros. Now, um, there are many different terms that can be used for zeros, and you need to be familiar with all of them because I don't know which one they're going to use. They can say zeros, they can say solutions, they can say roots, they can say x-intercepts. What it boils down to, any of those words, means that your function is equal to zero. And I feel like I'm forgetting one, but those are the most common ones. Um, or they could just ask you where is the function equal zero. <coughs> but anyways, that, that's what it all comes down to. Now, f of x is equal to x cubed plus 2x minus 1. We want to show that that has a zero in the interval from 0 to 1. Now, again, going back to that toolbox of functions, you should know that cubic functions, they cross the x intercept the x-axis at least once. Most of them, well not most of them, some of them cross three times, some of them cross once and touch once, some of them only cross once, but it has to cross once because one end is going down to negative infinity, one end is going to positive infinity. Same idea, it's got to cross the x-axis. But let's show specifically that it has a zero in this interval. So on this interval we need to find out well, what are the values of 0 and 1? What is f of 0? 0 cubed plus 2 times 0 minus 1. That is equal to negative 1. f of 1, plug that in. That 
that gives us 1 plus 2 minus 1, so that is equal to 2. So, one side of our interval was negative, one side of our interval was positive, therefore um, it does have a zero in that interval. Now let's write this um, in, the, in a mathematical way. Uh, so I would say since f of zero is less than zero, which is less than f of one, and f of x is continuous, by, and you can use IVT, you can use the abbreviation IVT, the Intermediate Value Theorem, uh, f of x has a zero in is in 0, 1. That is the way to write it in a complete sentence. If this were to be a free response question, this should be your response. Yes, ma'am. Because they were the endpoints, yes. Those are the endpoints of the interval. Right. Because one was less than the value in question, one was greater than the value in question. And in this case, the value in question was zero, so yes, negative and positive. But I say it that way just to keep it generic, because sometimes they might ask you about a different number. So as long as one of them's less than and one of them's greater than, you know it's got to hit that value somewhere in between. Okay, so this is the way you must, must, must write it. Okay. When you are providing explanations and justifications, you need to use definitions and theorems as much as possible. Okay? Now, not all the time will they apply, but in this case, we are specifically talking about the intermediate value theorem, so you, you've got to use that terminology somewhere in that explanation. Okay, let's look at one where it's not a zero. Okay, let's look at this function. Uh, the instructions say use IVT to show that f of x equals x cubed plus x takes on the value 9 for some x in 1 to 2, the interval from 1 to 2. So first of all, we've got to establish that our function is continuous. I failed to do that on the last problem until I was explaining. You should do that first. Make sure f of x is continuous on that interval. Okay, On that interval is another important thing. Uh, you can use the IVT on rational functions, which typically have discontinuities, as long as your interval doesn't include that discontinuity. Okay? Say, for example, this function um, was a rational function that had a vertical asymptote at negative 3. Okay? It's not continuous everywhere, but it's continuous on this interval, so we're good. Okay? Um, so it just has to be continuous on the interval in question, and this one is. So we plug in the x values of the endpoints into the function. We get 2 for f of 1. And we get 10 for f of 2. So since f of x is continuous, Technically, the continuous part should come first, but as long as you get it in there, in that explanation somewhere, it's fine. Since f of x is continuous and f of 1 is less than 9, which is less than f of 2, by IVT, f of x equals 9 for some x in that interval. <laughs> right. If f of 2 were 8, then we could not guarantee. Now, it very well may hit 9, somewhere between 1 and 2. 
um, even if the value of 2 was 8, but we cannot guarantee that it equals 9. It's a good question. Oh, that's probably mostly because um, they replaced my bulletin board, and they may have attempted to take it off first. I don't think I noticed that before. So I think they started to take it off and then realized, let's just leave it up there and attach the new ones to the old ones. And that's what they did. Anyways. One. Yeah. Okay. Um, just as a side note, based on these values, we could have used the IVT to show that this function equals 3 on the interval. We could have used it to say that it equals 5 somewhere on the interval. Anything between 2 and 10, we can guarantee that the function equals that y value for some x value between 1 and 2, whether it's 1.5, 1.1, 1.9999, 1 it's going to equal all the y values between 2 and 10 somewhere on that interval. Because it's polynomial. Exactly. Okay. So, um, let's look at another problem here. Okay. We have a function and a closed interval. You don't necessarily need to write down this paragraph of instructions. I would just write down the problem. Um, a function f and a closed interval a to b are given. We need to determine if the intermediate value theorem holds for the given value of k. If it does, then we need to find the value that, um, that makes that function equal that, that k value. Okay? Um, and if it doesn't hold, we need to explain why. Okay? So our first function is 2 plus x minus x squared. That's a polynomial, so our function is continuous. So we're good there. We need to check our endpoints. F of 0 would be 2. F of 3, I don't have to crunch the numbers because the rest, the other parts of it are going to be 0. F of 3 is 2 plus 3 minus 3 squared. So that's uh, 5 minus 9, which is negative 4. So is 1 between 2 and negative 4? It is. All right. So, yes, the intermediate value theorem holds. If it does, then we need to find out, well, what x value gives us a function value of 1? So here's part 2 of the problem. Set the function equal to 1 and solve. Now, this is a quadratic. We're solving for x. What must be true about quadratics in order to solve them for x? They must be equal to 0. Now, it's going to require me moving more stuff, but I'm going to move everything to the left side here because I don't like negative x squared. So I'm going to move x squared over so it becomes positive x squared. I'm going to move x so it becomes negative x, and 1 minus 2 is negative 1. Now, it would be marvelous if we could factor that. However, we cannot. So what's our other option? Without a calculator, what's our other option for solving this? Quadratic formula. Okay. Technically, we could complete the square, but I don't know anybody in here who would rather complete the square than do the quadratic formula. So let's do the quadratic <coughs> formula. All right. X equals negative B. Well, B is already negative 1, so that becomes positive 1 plus or minus the square root of b squared, well negative 1 squared is 1, minus 4 times a, which is 1, times c, which is negative 1, all over 2 times a. If you don't have the quadratic formula memorized, add that to your list of things to do. Alrighty, so 4 times 1 times negative 1 is negative 4, there's a minus sign in front of it, so that becomes plus 4, so 1 plus 4 is 5. That's as much simplifying as we can do for this problem because 5 is not a perfect square. It's got to stay under the square root. Uh, now, let's figure out. We've got 1 plus the square root of 5 over 2, and we have 1 minus the square root of 5 over 2. 
I don't think both of those are in my interval. 